Um, it's really nice to see everyone. I apologize I didn't stream over the weekend, but I should have some a bunch more time to do it later this uh, later this month. Today, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go over the implementation of MinGPT by Carpathy. So he has an educational example of how you can build a GPT-like model. It's actually very short. It's like 300 lines of code. That's it, and it explains a lot of stuff. That said, understanding it can be a bit tricky. It's a bit daunting if you're not used to the terminology of the attention is all you need paper. Um, so really, the goal here would be by the end of today, you'll understand exactly how MinGPT was implemented. You'll sort of know how to do various transformer architectures, how to fine tune them for various architectures. So it's going to be very applied. Like we're going to, you know, do maybe like two minutes of theory, and then the rest is just going to be like looking at code. Um, and I guess that we can end it with like some low hanging fruit where we think the repo can be improved. Um, I think realistically, I also said maybe I'll do ranking today. I doubt it. Uh, I think MinGPT will be enough. So maybe we'll do ranking like, uh, like later this week. So yeah, I mean, like without further ado, let's get started. And you know, as always, if this is your first time here, this is an educational stream. So if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. All right. So as I was saying, like this is the MinGPT implementation. It's like sort of a like Carpathy is like a, pretty much like ML celebrity at this point. It's great, uh, but for for good reason. Like I think one of the things he does a really good job at is providing like all of these educational examples of doing code, like really from first principles, right? Instead of using like libraries and making things endlessly complicated, keep them simple. This is a popular repo. It's like seven K stars. Um, if you go through it, you're gonna notice like well, there's a whole bunch of like boilerplate stuff then there's these three notebooks um and then there's the actual min gpt code and it's just like split up over four uh over four files so yeah i mean let's take a look right so let's say we're here at play car for example like what is this all right so what play car is is it's a it's a character level language model so what that is is given a sentence like, or, or a sequence of characters, really, predict the next most likely character. So it's useful for a bunch of stuff from language modeling to predicting, like, you know, protein sequences or whatever. Uh, generally useful. So a bunch of boilerplate here, like, okay, he sets up, like, some, some parameters in the logging library, sets a random seed, fixes it so that the results are producible. Right. So then the first thing we see is he has this thing called the car data set. So he's not using a you see, like, what's, what I kind of like about this is just he's loading some, uh, excuse me, just, like, some general, like, car data set instead of downloading a whole bunch of ran random stuff. So let's take a quick look at this. So here. Okay. So what the block size is, is this is, like, the number, I, I would imagine it's something like the number of characters that you're predicting at a time. And so, okay, you have a bunch of characters, you have like your vocab size, and then the, the data size, the, the, the number of characters. And then what's Stoy, what's Itos? So this is GI for, uh, okay, for I in enumerate cars. I've never seen the syntax before, actually. <laughs> this is already interesting, okay. I don't even know what that syntax is. So let's just create a new file called ipenb number 30 something. 46, holy shit. Okay, so let's say I have cars is equal to uh, A, B, C. What does this generate? Let's remove the self part. Interesting. So, oh, I see, I see. Sorry, sorry. This is, a, I've never seen a dictionary comprehension. I see. Yeah, sorry. I just got confused because I'm used to seeing, uh, list. I've never seen a dictionary comprehension ever used actually in my life. This is the first time. Okay, sorry about that. So, if we're to keep going, let's go here. Okay. So we're looking at characters, and then it's the same thing. I see. So we have the character to index, and then the index to character. So we have like these two dictionaries. We have the block size, the vocab size, and the data. The length of the data is 
whatever the length of the data is, minus the length of the block size, okay? And then if you want to get an item, how do they do it? So you get a chunk, and then this is index, index, plus self, plus box, box size, plus one. Yeah, okay, that's, that's exactly what I figured. Like, the block size is how many characters you're getting at a time. And then encode every character to an integer. Oh, I see. So this is interesting. So you see what he's doing? So he's basically turning, uh, like, characters and just creating, like, an embedding table for it. And he's just doing it by, like, assigning, like, sequential values. So I see you don't need to use something like NN embedding. You can just use, like, literally something like this. So I think yeah, this shows just showcases, like, um, like I, I guess how good he is at producing simple code. So the next thing he does is he's like, okay, well, we're going to provide like the X and Y values. So what are X and Y? So D, I think this to minus one. What does this do exactly? Let's take a look. Um, let's say I have A equals one, two, three. And then A of something to minus one, one, two. So, okay, everything except the last element I see. And then, okay, so you see what's going on here? So the, the, thing, the, the, the thing that's happening is we're producing, um, yeah, and then let's do the Y just to make sure. And then A of, I think it was one, like this. Two, three, wait, is that right? Okay, so what is this then? So we have one, two, three, this produces one, two, this produces two, three. I guess like these are the various blocks. Like maybe let's make this a bit bigger, see if it's clearer. Oh no, so this is basically everything except the last element, everything except the first element. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Where was it? Right, so the reason the block size is important is because when you're trying to make a prediction, like what you're ultimately going to do is you're going to see like a bunch of characters at once, or you're going to be predicting a bunch of characters at once. Um, so here, like, he's like, okay, well, you know, you can install this from here. So potentially an improvement here is adding, I mean, let's, let's list them down. Actually, I, I, I was thinking about this earlier. Um, so I think the improvements are in the notebook, W get the data. Then add the CI and uh, releases on PyPy. Uh, run the notebooks as a test. Okay, so one line of poem is roughly 50 characters. Okay, so we're taking in roughly two and a half lines of a poem. And then the config looks like very general here. So he's actually going to create his own trainer, his own GPT config, and his own model. So the config are what you the configs are what you can expect in a constructor. So this is going to be the size of your vocabulary, uh, the training blocks, the number of layers, number of heads, the number of embeddings, and then the, the GPT is actually the model itself, and it takes in a configuration to instantiate. So you can imagine that here GPT will be some class and it's init. It takes an and it's init function, it takes an object of type GPT config and then creates a config. And then you have the trainer config, which uh, takes in like pretty much all unsurprising things, right? Like learning rate decay, like number of warm-up tokens, number of workers. I would expect maybe this is for data loaders, but we can make sure because I don't think this is a DDP example, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it is. Um and then there's a trainer itself. So this is a trainer config and it's the exact same thing, right? Like a trainer trainer, a trainer then takes in a training config, it takes in a data set, it takes in a model and then it trains. Once it trains, you wanna take samples from this thing. So what a sample is, is you're basically gonna say, well, given the model, uh, given some like basically input data to prime the model, I don't know what this parameter is, a temperature is basically like a degree of randomness in your predictions. So if you're trying to get reproducible results, you, you don't want to have any temperature. Uh, you want a sample and top K basically means that like, let's say, imagine you have something like, like the automatic inbox replies in Gmail. Uh, so the top K there is really three because it's showing you three responses. 
In practice, it tends to be higher. Maybe it's 10, and then they have some like rule-based models that comes in and, and does stuff. And then you basically print out like all the prediction. So this is what this is here. All right. So this was fun. So I think now, um, I figured before we start looking at the model, let me sort of give you a crash course for GPT, right? So this is the attention is all you need paper. And this is a great paper. And by the way, like I will say after reading a lot of very simple explanations of this on Twitter, uh, I will still say like the original paper is still one of the best educational references for this. Uh, and really it comes down to these pictures. Like for, like for me personally, like I found this very scary initially. So let me make it not so scary for you. The original uh, Attention's All You Need paper had both uh, this part, which is encoders, and then this part here, which is the decoder network. Uh, if you know, like, for example, like uh, bidirectional RNNs, for example, or like any, any sort of model that involves like compression, uh, you basically want to create like some sort of representation for your data. And the way you do this is uh, you first like compress it to some sort of like lower, lower dimension. And then you try to comp compress it, like uncompress it from that lower dimension back to your original input. So this is what's called an autoregressive architecture, as in you're trying to predict the input. So that's your label. But, you know, mechanically, you know, that, that's all fine and good. But but really here, the, the, the key is, is, the, is like what you see in these boxes. So you have some sort of input embedding. And this is exactly what we saw earlier with you taking like let's say a bunch of characters and turning them into integers. So you can come up with your own embedding. It's essentially a key value store. PyTorch has one by default called nn.embedding. But you know, implementing it is basically just creating a key value store. You also take in the in positional encoding. So this is basically also giving an ID for your order in a sentence. So again, this could be an integer. Like let's say the, 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 the let's say a sentence is of has like 10 words in it, then if you have positional encoding nine, it means you're the ninth word or the last word because zero would be the first. Once you have this, you feed it to something called the multi-edit attention. So you literally duplicate the input three times. And then you have this like magic function here called a multi-edit attention. Uh, and then you add the output of this to the actual input. So if you've seen like architectures like ResNet, so this is just a residual connection. And mechanically, this will actually just look like a torch.add. And then there'll be basically here like the like X, like your input embedding, plus the plus the output of the multi-edit attention. So it's gonna look like, yeah. And then you normalize the whole thing. Then you have another feed forward network. So that's just like an, an, an n dot linear, and then add the norm. So add this torch.add. Norm could be layer norm, it could be batch norm, it could be like lamb, like sorry, lamb is an optimizer, I apologize. But there's like a whole bunch of kinds of norms that you could use. They'll have different trade-offs. So what this n is, is that we're basically going to take in, so we call this a transformer block, right? So this is called an encoder block. What we're going to do is we're going to take this block and then we're going to repeat it n times. And the way to do this in PyTorch is with something called an n module list. So for example here, where was it? Module list here. So for example, here in module list, like effectively here, like this is it. So we're gonna, let's say, create like nn dot linear of size 10, 10. And then we're gonna say for i in range 10. So we're gonna have 10 layers like this. Uh, and they're all gonna be added in a module list. And then when you apply forward, what that does is it goes over each element in the linear layer and just applies it and keeps going, right? So there's no magic here with, in terms of like doing it. It's literally just like a, a, a for loop uh, or like just like a, like a pipeline, and then and then module list makes it a bit uh, simpler to, to program. All right? Okay. Once we get to the decoder here, and I was like, well, wait a minute, like another uh, like residual connection. Okay, and now I have like my output embedding, so that's assuming I already have some sort of output. So initially, this would just be nothing, and then the same thing. Well, additional norm, add norm, a feed forward, add norm linear and softmax. Right? So now. This is really just to get like some probabilities. But mechanically, if you look at this, I don't want anything to be scary. Like the hardest part is really just the multi-headed attention. 
Uh, I don't know if Carpathy actually implemented this. I think someone who did a really good job of implementing it and someone I'd highly recommend you to subscribe to is Al Aladdin Pearson. <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> yeah, so this guy has like this tutorial here. I thought it was great because he goes over how to implement like transformers with ein sum notation. I really, really enjoyed it. I found it much, much clearer than most of the content like I'd read on Transformers Online. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend that one. It's long, but you know, like really, really worth it. Great. So, you know, pretty much like I think we have all of the theory that we need to get started. So I think let's just get started now. Let's just start going over Carpathy's code. Right. So just so you believe me here, like I ran Clock, which is a utility I use to count like the basically measure the complexity of some new code base i'm working with um so as you can see uh, there's a jupiter there, there's like a jupiter notebook with like a lot of comments but about 300 lines of code so there's three of them play math play image but they're they're all mechanically the same as in like here like he's cr sort of creating his own data sets for each one so for example if you want to create a math data set well the, the way you would do that is you can just for example say like well like here like this will be something like this it'll be simpler here uh so let's say you know my x is uh one two uh you know my x is like let's say plus uh one uh two and my y is equal to three right and so now produce a neural network that given so basically your nn dot forward needs to take in x uh yeah, so your model dot forward will take in x and needs to produce y. So essentially, like this is the way like he creates data sets. It's kind of a clever trick, actually. But for math, the good thing is you don't need anyone to create a data set for you. You can sort of generate them using like arithmetic. Um, so it's like again like a great sanity check, right? Like if before you get into data and creating data loaders and parsing and know them, it's too big and resizing it, like. There's like another really nice sanity check that you could do. All right. So again, like I said, there's there's four files here. I'll go over the simple ones because I think, uh, you know, like it, it sort of usually helps. Like, well, let's, let's go from easy easy to hard. Okay, so easiest is this init.py. There's nothing. Great. So there's three files left. Great. So now in this file, uh, all, this, all this does is it sets a bunch of random seeds from, so it fixes the randomness in Python. It fixes the randomness in NumPy. It fixes the randomness in Torch. And it fixes, it fixes the randomness in CUDA. What this does, instead, this top K essentially looks at a like a list and then computes the, the four largest values. So like if you have a softmax where you're picking the first, that's effectively a top one logit, right? But if you're if you want to pick the top K ones. Well, it turns out you don't need to do anything. Like Torch already already has something like this, um, and then you can just basically pick out the values here. So he also has something here like a sample function. Mechanically, this isn't super important, but again, like the way it works is uh, here. So if top k is not a none, then you basically sample using the top k logits function. But if here, where 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 is the Where's the noise temperature? Where's temperature used? Here. So you can see here that the logits are changed by like a temperature factor. And effectively, all this does is add some randomness to the predictions. The point is, is like, there's a few reasons why you want to do this. Like, let's say if you're having a conversation with someone, then they're not always going to say the same thing if you say if you repeat the same thing right like they may be like oh like why are you repeating the same thing to me or something so this is sort of one way of encoding like that sort of bias um and the other thing interesting thing about it is that like you know randomness is sometimes good like there's sort of like this in reinforcement learning the exploit like the exploit explore trade-off uh, so you can use this trade-off right so but again here like actually if you look at this if sample is equal like let's say this is true so what this is going to do is it's going to generate like a multinomial distribution with the probabilities drawn from the logits. So basically it's going to turn the logits into a probability distribution. All that means is that the values sum up to one. 
right? And that the, all the values are positive. Like that's what it really means to have a probability distribution. And we're gonna get a, a single sample here, right? And if samples if sample is not up, instead we're just gonna straight up give the top k values back. And we're gonna append them to the sequence and continue. So this is really important. Like if you look at the sample part, it has a torch donor grad on top, so it means it's being used within a torch module, but we don't want any of the parameters to be learnable here. Like this is a deterministic function. So we're basically catting x with ix along dimension one. And effectively what this does is it basically takes an existing sequence that you've generated and it appends uh, the element that you that you sampled near the very end. Great, yeah, easy, right? So we're two files down, just like one to go. Um, let's look at the trainer, what's easier? Yeah, let's do the trainer. So the trainer here is basically, imagine you're like, PyTorch doesn't have a native training loop. Uh, so, but if you, if you are used to using trainers, like maybe you've used like a library like Ignite, maybe you've used like Hugging Face Trainer, maybe PyTorch Lightning, maybe, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of trainers nowadays, like there's the Mosaic one, a lot of trainers. Um, so if, if you want to have a config object, like effectively all this does here is it's, it's essentially a data class, right? Like it's basically... So maybe we could actually, oh, that's actually maybe another improvement we could do. Uh, implement uh, config as a, as a data class. Right? So what this does is it's going to say, okay, well, well, what are some important configurations? Like, well, you have max epochs and maybe we'll type the config as well. Maybe. Right, so you're gonna have a learning rate, you're gonna have like, so betas, I believe this is used like for the atom optimizer, if I'm not mistaken. So it takes two parameters, not just the learning rate. Uh, the norm of the gradients when you're clipping them. So this is like, if you have gradients that are too big, you may wanna clip them. Uh, weight decay, I forget what weight decay is. We'll see, learning rate decay is basically making the learning rate smaller over time. Ideally because, uh, you've gotten better like basically you want to change your you want to change your model less over time warm-up tokens and final tokens i'm not sure what these are checkpoint path and yeah number of workers like i figured like this is for the data loader uh what's the weight decay let's see by simply adding some penalty Oh, I see. Oh, it just means adding L2 norm. I see. Okay, never mind. Yeah, okay, great. So, as you can see here, like the way this works is like, well, you're going to have like four in it and then four KV in KWARGs items. So, KWARGs will be the inputs that the class is getting. So, it's going to turn them into a dict and then it's going to set the attribute on each one. This is exactly where data classes are really helpful in, in Python. Great. So that's done. So now we, we have this model. You have a training data set, you have a test data set, and you have a config. <clears throat> so if so then you're gonna see, well, if torch CUDA is available, uh, we're gonna say device is CUDA current device, and then model is torch and then data parallel. Yes, yeah, so maybe another thing we could do is uh, port go to work with distributed data parallel. Right? So what else can we do? So then, okay, so we have a safe checkpoints. So you keep the raw model in attribute form, module of as attributes of model, module as model, saving checkpoint path, config path, self.config, config path, config equals config. Oh, I see, okay, sure. So the model, so this is gonna be actually of type trainer config. This is where types really help. So. I'm gonna add this as well. Uh, here. All right, okay. So 
Okay, so now let's look at train. So the way train is gonna work is, let's see here, so run epoch. So if the model is in training mode, otherwise it's gonna be in inference mode, put the losses in the list. So he's gonna also instantiate a progress bar, which is gonna basically enumerate the number of elements in your data loader. Uh, if it's train, else enumerate loader. What's the difference? So we're just skipping TQDM if we're training? I guess that kind of makes sense, right? Like you don't want to have progress, you just want to spit out the output. Because when you're training, you're not going to be printing anything. So great, okay. So then we like look at this. So because he's created a PyTorch data, data loader, it's going to say like this is an enumerate. So it's already, it's already enumerated here. So this is the, the iteration. And then x, y is your input and output. You place each of them on the corresponding torch device. And then you enable, uh, like you enable gradients. The logits and the loss, so this will be what your model outputs. You're going to get a bunch of losses. He's saying collapse all the losses if they are scattered on multiple GPUs. Append the losses. And then what do you do? Okay. Great. So in this case, like, well, you, you, you've you done a single iteration of the data. You've calculated the loss. Uh, you've collapsed all of the losses, right? So like that's what the loss dot mean, dot mean was about. So now you want to zero out the gradients. You want to actually apply your loss, which means you want to actually like do your, you want to, you want to do the, like, like your, your backwards pass. You're going to clip the gradients. So the, the gradients are going to be clipped by the argument in the in the config, which was one. And it's gonna be applied to all of the parameters in the model. So parameters is gonna print out like all the weights because it's gonna be all the trainable things, like all the things that change are your parameters. Uh, so once you've applied your loss, once you've done the gradient, then you can do an optimizer dot step, right? So optimizer here is like raw model configure optimizers. Where's configure optimizers? Okay, it looks like that's in the model. So that's going to be the last file we go over, right? So then there's like a bunch of stuff. Like, well, if, if learning if, if learning rate decay is on, you look at the number of tokens that were processed and then you like adjust the learning rate by like a factor of that, right? Like uh, otherwise, like let's say there's no learning rate decay. It's saying like, well, let's do a cosine late learning rate decay. Uh, and... Let's see. So if tokens less than config warm up tokens, okay. So we do a linear warm up with a cosine learning rate decay. What's the cosine learning rate decay? Uh, so the learning rate decay. So the progress is tokens minus config warm up token. Okay, that's just the progress. Let's, let's scratch that for a second. So it's oh, it's literally going to be the max of zero point one and half times one plus cosine of pi times progress. Okay. Whatever happened to good old exponential decay? Is this like common even? Like I feel like embarrassed. I feel like it's been forever since I've actually trained a model. Oh, cosine annealing. Oh, it's cyclical. That's why I see. Uh, Interesting, yeah, it reminds me of the like the one cycle trick from fast AI, but you're just using like a trig function to, to simulate it. Kind of clever trick actually. The formula is actually more complex than I expected. Like I don't think I memorized this thing from scratch. Uh, just generally though, like I don't know what all of this is doing, but if you see a cosine, usually you're exhibiting some sort of cyclical behavior. Um, right, so then we want to print out the loss. And if we're not training, if not is trained, then the test loss, we get the test loss and just log it. And then we check, are you better than the, I guess the, the best test loss? So there's a training data loader here. So the training data loader is using the data loader from PyTorch. So maybe another improvement is uh, port torch data. Okay. So 
Full memory, pin memory, batch config size, that's great, okay. Keep going. So early stopping. So where is early stopping here? If self the data set, test loss is equal best loss. And good model. Test loss is equal is less than best loss. So if test loss is bigger than best loss, then it's not a good model and stop, I see. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, so I'd say there's nothing too surprising here. There's obviously like a, a couple of improvements I think that could be done. I'm just writing them all here. I'll always do them myself. I think this sounds fun. Uh, so I think now, like, you know, I've been, I think, edging everyone. So let's get to like the, the meat of uh, the meat of today, right? So it's still like by, by meat, I still mean it's still, a you know, 200 lines of Python. It's not crazy, but, you know, it helps, right? So... First off, let's see. So he's creating this GPT config. He's using the same trick of doing the KV, KWARGS items. So again, this is where data classes uh, really, really shine. So we should we should just use those. <clears throat> so then there's an embedding P drop. Let's see. Stem consists of a combination of token encoding and positional encoding. So like I said, if you remember this picture here. So by the way, multi-edit detention does exist natively within PyTorch. Although, funnily enough, I did see Carpathy rant that he wasn't a, the biggest fan of the implementation. Right. All right. So okay. <clears throat> so I, I don't know what, what this is exactly. Um, let's see. I think like at least within GPT here, if you see this, let's go back to the picture again here. So the number of layers that we have here um, is going to be like essentially like the number like it could be like just the number of transformer blocks, right? So how many times is this thing repeated? This whole thing. Uh, the number of heads will be like you're gonna have like the th the same input copied three times to the same box, right? And then which is called the multi-headed attention. But if you have like let's say ten heads, they're just gonna pay attention to slightly different things. And because this is like implemented, then like it's like the weights are gonna be learned via backprop. Different attention heads will specialize at different things. Like for example, maybe one attention has like really good at finding verbs or one that's good at finding insults or whatever. And the very same way, when you look at something like an image filter in convolutional networks, you can sometimes see stuff like, oh, like this knows how to detect lines, like this knows how to detect like red colors. Uh, in language, it's gonna be very much the same. So this, like, like each, each head will specialize at finding certain kinds of relationships between tokens in a sentence. Okay, yeah, I like this a lot. So he's using a vanilla multi-head attention, uh, and he's saying like, well, okay, yeah. So the, the, the way this is implemented here, the multi-headed attention, is you have like three linear layers, like one called the key, one called the query, and one called the value. They're actually all going to have the exact same shape. So like mechanically, this is pretty much all the same. I see. So, and then there's like a different, like I, I think there's different dropouts like one for the attention and one for the residual. Oh, I see. So this has here, like this, let me zoom in, sorry. This will have its own dropout and then this will have its own dropout, All right? So this is what these two are. The output prediction is this. So it's gonna be a linear layer. Also, like, look at this, like it's all n embed, n embed. Uh, and then here, like the register buffer, what is this? What's what's storage trill? Storage trill takes a matrix. Storage trill. Oh, a triangular matrix, I see. Oh, I see, I see, sure, sure. So let me show you this quickly. Uh, where was it? Uh, 
Okay, they don't show it here. I think uh, Jay had a good picture of this. Da, da, da. I promise this is going somewhere. Is it not here? Why is it not here? I think meter Peter Blom. Let's see. So I think these are all like great tutorials in general, but I think Peter's and Aladdin's, I think, was, was my favorite. Oh, here we go, yeah. Okay. So, if you're pretending, like, imagine that each, uh, each row is basically uh, the predictions you're going to make from that word. So, for example, here you're saying, uh, well, I want to predict, like, all of these words. But I can't look at this word. And now here you're saying, okay, I want to predict all of these words, but I can't predict these words. And same thing here, I want to predict all these words, but I can't look at these words. Uh, the reason you do this is because you don't want to sort of look at, it's like, let's say in time series, if you're making a prediction and you look at future inputs, like, that's not really fair, right? Like, for example, maybe like another way to read this would be, like, let's say this is the first output. Uh, like how do I explain this? Uh, so if you're at the last word in, a, in the output, you should be able to look at all of the outputs before you. But if you're so like really, this is what you can look at in the dark blue, or maybe it's the opposite. I don't know. I get confused with the triangulars. Uh, but really, okay. So this is gonna be torch dot one config block size. I mean, why don't we why don't we do this right? So let's let's take a look at this thing. I think I'll make it clear. Okay. Okay. So then we're going to say import torch. And while this happens, we're going to say uh, block size equals, I don't know, five. Let's see what happens. What happened to my view? Okay, I have an extra parenthesis, I think, right? Yeah. Okay. Kind of cool, right? So, like, in this case here, okay, oh, I see. So this, we're, we're then going to multiply this by linear, right, I believe. Okay. So let's say we have now uh, nn dot linear of five five. So this is x. And then we're gonna say, let's say this is mask. This is x. X times mask. How do I do this? Does this work? Unsupport an operand type for linear and tensor. Hmm. I think this wrong. Like, is this what is the operation here? Let's see. Okay, so you can see, for example, here, where is it? Q at K. I guess yeah, it was it was a bit more complicated. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'm not gonna go over the the explanation of multi-headed detention today. Like I think I want to do like a whole separate video uh, just on that. But like when I told you it's the most complicated part, like I, I really meant it. Uh, but at least okay. So here they they do have the type. So like let's say key query value. So uh, key is the so this is the batch size. T is what sequence length, and then embedding dimensionality. Why C though? Um, and then transpose one two. How does transpose work in PyTorch? So this 
the reason I'm confused with this terminology is I found the Einsum notation much clearer for this. Uh, dimension, oh, so you're picking the two dimensions that are being swapped. So you're picking the first and the second dimension, first and second, first and second. And then here we're saying like view. So I think view, this view includes like a reshape here. And they all have the same shape. Okay, so like the batch size, number of uh, an H, which is, what's an H? What's HS? Uh, BTC, number of heads. C dot self head. I think it's like heads really is what it means. C number of heads, okay, we'll see. Uh, okay, great. So then we want to do the attention. We do the mass fill. Then you just have like the softmax that you're applying, dropout. So this is the second, the second one, and then yeah, okay, and the prediction. So I did say like this is the most complicated. I think this needs its own video because like it's just it's very confusing. Like what's going on? What's up with all these reshapes? There's tons of tutorials about this. I personally didn't find any that particularly good except Aladdin's to explain this part. So I think what we'll do is let's assume that someone created this for you, right? Like let's assume, or you're using the multi-edit attention in PyTorch, right? Let's assume that exists, right? It's sort of like when you're implementing convolutional neural networks, like you don't always think about how convolutions work, even though they are fairly straightforward to implement and maybe I'll do a video about that, yada, yada. However, what I, what I, what I, the point I really want to come across is here is like back to the block, right? So If we have this block, here I was, look at the paper. So let's say, assume someone implemented this, then that's good. Then we basically have this attention, we have this addition and norm, and we have this feed forward, and then we have this addition and norm again, right? And so again, if you look at, you, we said norms, so we're going to create two layer norms. So that's LN1 and LN2. Uh, we're going to have the actual attention module. Um, and then we're also going to have an, an N sequential layer here. So here, where is it? So this is going to have like an N linear config embed times four config embed a gelu. So just a, just a non linearity. Uh, maybe let me comment. Uh, I think another improvement is, uh, comment next to the Right, so end dropout config residual p probability. That's great. Yeah. So here, so back to this. Remember, here. Uh, well, the output of this thing here, like sorry, the input of this thing, or again, sorry. Here, like let's look at this. So you have x, and then you're doing self attention on self ln x. I feel like this is missing something, right? Like this really should be. Oh, but then that's the whole x, right? So then x is equal to x plus this. And then, no, something's wrong here. Okay. It's also interesting how he's adding the layer norm before the layer. I thought it would imagine it'd be after. It looks like it's after the layer to me. Uh, let me just double check. Is layer norm applied right order? Okay, well, let's assume it's applied in this order. Then, yeah, you apply the tension and then you add to it, you add the input on top of it. So the difference here really seems to be um, is that the norm is applied to the to the input of this thing. So it's more like norm, attention, and then we have an addition here. So if you look at it that way, you know, it, it makes sense now. So the actual MLP though, looks like, oh, I see. So let's see the MLP here. MLP is linear config embedding, four times config embedding. 
Okay, so you notice this, by the way, like we're just so this is just a way to make like basically expand the size out and then expand it back down because we're going from a large size to a medium size, non linearity, large size to medium size. Um, I'm kind of confused here. Like, so if I were to look at the MLP, so that's the feed forward. I mean, Again, like the layer norm is happening on the input. Um, let's see, maybe I'm not understanding something. Let's see, norm. Yeah, you see, I wasn't wrong. Like, it looks like here they differ in the order in which they apply the norm. Unless layer norm is applied to the inputs. Like, this is what's confusing me here. Layer No, it's not. There's a bug. Okay, let's go back now to the model. So, you know, th this is all like mechanics, but you know, like as you can see, like really once you have this block, like the rest is kind of relatively uh, trivial, right? Like it's sort of, you know, th this is sort of like beginner Python stuff. This is a bit like, you know, <laughs> like like what the hell's going on, right? Like this part is easier, like, oh, the key query value is just like linear layers and then uh, things just kind of get a bit wild here. So I think like here I may need to do a visual tutorial, I think, of the maybe like more comments. Next to self attention layer. Okay. So then okay. So then if you go to the actual GPT model, great. Okay. So again, back to this like you see why I really love this figure? It's 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 just, it's, just, it's just a great picture, by the way. So this is called the or this is the original transformer architecture. It's called an encoder decoder model. If you were to use GPT, GPT is what's called decoder only. So you just take this part and you repeat it. What Bird is is encoder only. So you take this part and, and you just repeat that. So you know, like again, so this is just shows you shows you the the like it's all relatively simple right and you could oh maybe you could come up with your own architecture where encoder decoder encoder decoder i don't know or like you maybe these don't have to be matched like to the same size like i don't know like you could you could just go creative or maybe add more residual connections like add a residual connection from here to here or from here to here whatever it doesn't matter like you, you can do you can do whatever the hell, you can do whatever the hell you want but the main ideas i think are like you have some form of normalization you have the multi-headed detention, which is initially complex to implement, but once you get used to it, not too bad. And again, I'm going to make a whole separate video about that. Feed forward, which you should know about. Basically, it's just a linear layer, but more than one, because that's what a deep neural network is. It's multiple linear layers. Oh, but multiple linear layers, one after the other, are very useful. So you add a non-linearity in between them, like Gelu or Relu or whatever you wanted. They, they, they all like work, you know, they all do the same thing. So... Once we have the full GPT model now, they're gonna say, well, we have a, we're gonna have a context size and a block size. So we have the token embedding. Okay, so instead of like creating the embedding like manually, uh, here actually, no, it's it's set like self position embedding. Uh, one config block size, config and embed. Uh, what does this mean exactly? So, the block size. Interesting, yeah, so maybe let me explain. Another thing I could do is the block terminology. There's more comments.
<clears throat> so, I mean, yeah, so this is like another example of the scale dot product attention. So given these key value pairs, you have matmol, do a scaling operation, you have the mass, softmax, matmol. This works the exact same way, but you do it multiple times and then you can concatenate everything with torch.cat and then you apply a linear layer. So again, it looks simple, but but I, I do recognize the code there. It doesn't look super straightforward. All right, let's go back here. It's just in time losing my voice again. <clears throat> All right. So we have this whole code around like initializing weights. So if, if we have a layer norm, then we're editing zero in at once module weight. If it's an instance module GPT, then... Okay, this is kind of interesting. I never thought about this too much. Uh, I wonder, like... Why do we need this? Or, like, why can't this be collapsed a bit more? Like, would it be the end of the world if... Module bias is not done? I don't get why we need a different mean and standard deviation here. Okay, so... Why does... Okay, so this long running function configure optimizer is unfortunately doing something very simple and is being very defensive. We are separating out all parameters of the models in two, two buckets, those that will experience weight decay for regularization and those that won't, bias, layer norm, and embedding weights. We are then returning the PyTorch optimizer object. Interesting. Be simplified. Okay, that's great. I'm pretty sure there's some, some way to do this with effects, like where you can look at the params and do something. Is birth traceable? I feel like it should be. This feels way too complicated for what it's trying to do. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So back to the Ford of the GPT model. Let's look at the picture again, right? Let's do side by side. Oh, you know, it's not going to fit. Yeah, let me open the picture here. All right. So we said GPT is decoder only. So we're going to first take the output embedding and the positional embedding. So token embedding plus positional embedding. And the reason why we're using T here. Oh, I see. I think like we're, um, it's like we're jumping like in blocks of size T throughout the input. And so if it's a block, the position embedding refers to a bunch of tokens. Okay, that's great. So then what we basically do is we, we do a drop. So what's drop here? Okay. So we're doing a dropout on the embeddings and then we want to create a bunch of blocks, right? So what's blocks? Okay, so this is using the, the, the basically the module list. So in Python, if you see an input that starts with star then a list, what this is for is to basically turn a function, turn an input that's a list 
into 10 elements and an n sequential works with an arbitrary number of elements right because you could basically say like linear then relu or whatever and so then each element of the sequential is a block where we define the block to be this really trivial thing as soon as we figured out how to implement uh, self-attention and we're going to do this number of layer times all right so that's pretty much it so that, that gives us the number of blocks that we have uh, then we're going to do what's lnf lnf okay then we apply a layer norm this makes more sense and then the logits here are back to self uh head let's go to head yeah you see this so why is the output config vocab size right because ultimately this is going to output like a probability uh for uh for for every for every possible token in the vocabulary and then it's embedding because that's just like the dimensionality that we picked and ideally like an embed should be smaller than vocab size although if it's bigger it probably also works um uh, great and then if we're given some desired target also calculate the loss so here it's like you're gonna say well loss is equal to none if targets is not none so here look targets is an optional value then you get the binary cross entropy for the logits and the target. And then you return the logits and the loss. So this is usually none. If targets is none, if not, it pretty much just works. <coughs> so yeah, I think I, I, I think that's pretty much uh, it for today. I lost my voice, but... I think what we went over today is we basically went through MinGPT, like we showed how we can use it, how we set up a trainer config, a model config, how to set up an optimizer. We learned like a couple of cool tricks in PyTorch from like using triangular matrices to setting up a mask uh, to like the view function and reshape and cat along certain dimensions. So lots of cool new features. So I suggest you just skim over the video again if there's a couple that seemed relevant. But, but I, really, the main message I want you to go away from this is given module lists, given constructs for kinds of normalizations like near nor layer norm, and then given like just an n linear, you can really create like very complex model architectures, assuming that someone created like this multi-headed attention module for you in the same way that when you're implementing like an architecture like UNet or ResNet 50, you're not necessarily implementing a convolution from scratch. Like you would just use someone else's implementation. Uh, so given that, it's really trivial. Like BERT actually becomes like BERT and GPT and all of these transformer models become really easy. Uh, hopefully looking at, you know, I recommend you go over the original transformer paper again because it's going to show you just like how simple these different architectures are. And once you know how everything works, uh, I think probably for the next session, I will be going over how to implement multi-headed detention from scratch with, I think, pictures, because otherwise it's not going to make too much sense. Uh, and then I think you can expect a whole bunch of other videos. I have like the Spytos from scratch series that I've been working on. So hopefully there should be more implementations from scratch of things like a convolutional layer, a pooling layer, GNN operations for graph neural networks. And again, I think, but we're first going to start off with attention because I think it's just so important. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I think I will likely just fork Carpathy's repo and make all of my improvements. I think there's too many at once for him to like plausibly accept my uh, my PR. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be good stuff. So thank you, everyone. I, I really enjoyed this. So if you have any other suggestions of content you'd like me to do, uh, please let me know and, you know, keep learning. Bye-bye, everyone.